Um, I'm going to talk this morning on metabolic stone disease, and uh, I thought what I would do is actually, rather than give a sort of standard blow-by-blow uh, -blow description of every risk factor and how to, uh, how to diagnose each uh, risk factor for metabolic stones, and then uh, how to treat each of those risks, which I think is a standard uh, chapter textbook you could read in any, in any uh, of our textbooks. I'm going to focus on a number of the newer concepts in some uh, uh, of the controversial areas that have been in the literature in the past uh, few years. And I'm going to really spend a good chunk of time talking about the relevance of hyperoxaluria versus hypercalciuria. Uh, and I want to put it in, in, in an overall context of evaluating patients with recurrent calcium stones. Now, what we know are some basic facts. Uh, stones affect up to 12% of the adult population, which means they're very common. The lifetime recurrence approaches 90% among uh, any stone patient, and if, particularly if you're a stone patient with a, uh, with a relative who has a history of stones, uh, you're, you're pretty much assured of having recurrent stones unless you uh, uh, embark on some type of stone risk reduction. And that when you do uh, metabolic evaluations of patients, that uh, about 97% of patients have identifiable risk factors, all of which is a way of saying that if you uh, make a dedicated effort to, to look at your patients and identify what are the risks that they have for kidney stones, you can almost always come up with at least one risk factor, quantifiable risk factor. And then in theory, if you could somehow uh, intervene and change that parameter that you would reduce the risk of stones. This is uh, some literature published in the American Journal of Internal Medicine um, a few years back by Charlie Pack, um, in which he looked at over uh, 3,000 consecutive patients that they evaluated at, uh, at UT Southwestern. And uh, keep in mind, this was a type of, of rigorous evaluation where everyone was in hospital for, for about two weeks' time. They had or one week time, I should say, they had a, um, uh, a formal diet that they were given and they were put on a, uh, a, a low calcium and normal calcium diet and then they had various analyses done. But, but essentially, it's a modified version of what we do in, in getting 24-hour urines and uh, blood tests. And these were all of the risk factors which were defined and, and patients could have more than one. But you can see, not surprisingly, that the single most common risk factor uh, was uh, low volume in... 70% of, uh, 70 of uh, patients. Hypercalciuria in about 40% of patients. Oops. Uh, <laughs> Can I ask you to <laughs> figure out what, what they want, please? <laughs> I like that. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Hypercalcia in 40% of patients. Hypernatocuria in about 35% uh, of patients, hyperuricosuria in 25%, hyperoxaluria in 20%, and uh, hypocytaturia in almost 20% of patients. Now, it's important that you put these uh, numbers in a, in a bit of context. I think if you look at other uh, papers, you'll find that hypercalciuria is ranged from about 30 to 40%. Hypocytaturia is normally quoted in the range of 40%, and it's, it's somewhat low in this paper. Uh, hypernatocuria is a little bit high. In this paper, hyperoxaluria is also quite low. Uh, the other thing, which, which uh, there's a number of differences in the way people who do metabolic stone disease report their data. PAC is very strict in that he gives you exact numbers and says if you're above this threshold, that's high. If you're below that threshold, you're, you're normal. Uh, there's a move within the literature, one which I, which I agree with, where basically we view these, these threshold values as... Uh, as uh, uh, moving targets, that they're, that, that they're not aligned in the sand. Uh, you have to think of this as if you're a mole of solute floating down in urine, uh, as you approach a, a supersaturation threshold or you get into a metastable phase, that's when you start to uh, solidify, when you crystallize. And, and it's in this context that these values are continuous. They're not discrete normal versus abnormal values. So as a result, I think most people, when they quote hyperoxaluria values, generally use a sliding scale that if you're in a high normal range, because you'll have uh, variations in, in urine concentration throughout a 24-hour period, 
your, your daily range might be in the high normal range of, of oxalate, which Pat would call normal, but other people would call abnormal because in reality, you, as you dehydrate at night, then your, your oxalate uh, saturation will increase above a, a saturation threshold. Is that clear? I think this is very important in understanding how to address patients because a lot of times you get lab values which come back normal when I would look at them and say, these are all high normal, these are all suspicious for, uh, for being discreetly abnormal if you consider the fact that there's variations in urine output. Do you need to be stone free before you need to be 24 hours? That's a, that's a question which has never been uh, answered adequately. There's only one paper I'm aware of uh, that came from uh, the Naval Hospital in Balboa where they looked at, I don't know, several hundred consecutive patients. Everyone underwent the metabolic evaluation at the time they were seen in the ER. So they came in with a repeat stone attack, which is really when, when patients are motivated to, to do something about this so they never have it again. You said, you never want to have this pain again? Well, I want you to fill those buckets with urine and come back uh, to your urology evaluation with, with your urine. So they, they, they captured a lot of patients that way. They then waited for them to get stone free, did uh, the, the metabolic evaluation again three weeks later. They never published the data. They presented that to AUA, and it was incomplete, the analysis they did. So uh, I'm giving you all the caveats here. I spoke with Chris Kane, who was the lead author, a couple of years later, and said, Chris, what, what, did you, what did you do with this data? And he said, we showed overall on the population that there's about a 92% concordance, meaning that there was uh, uh, the same total number of hypercalcurias, hyperoxylurias, hypocytosurias, everything um, uh, was roughly equivalent across the board. But as he recalls, in any individual patient, the concordance dropped to about 40%. So someone who was hypercalcuric at the time they presented the ER might have been hypocytosuric but normal calcuric three weeks after they were stone free. So he, he didn't know how to put this in context, we never published it. So we can take that as, as this data does not support doing analysis and color stone free, or you could take this as you might pick up other uh, subtle abnormalities if you do it right away. So a qualified maybe. Um, this is a, uh, just a laundry list of, of all of the major uh, abnormalities to look for and how you would identify them. Um, and I'm going to move quickly off of this table into what I think are the more interesting uh, issues facing us. But yeah, okay, this will go down this menu. So low volume, which is defined arbitrarily as two liters or less of urine out for the day. Uh, patients rarely know what their urine volume is. Obviously, if you do a 24-hour urine, you can quantify it. Whether that represents what they have all the time, I don't know. I think what you want to do with, uh, with uh, the, uh, volume, though, is, is just get patients to tell you whether or not their urine is, is clear or yellow. If it's yellow, it's a sign that they're dehydrated, and they would uh, do well to increase their hydration status. Then we have a whole number of hypercalcurias. This is a PAC, uh, Charlie Pack classification. The group of hypercalcuria type 1, type 2, type 3, or renal hypercalcuria. Uh, and then I'll include in, among the hypercalcuria is primary hyperparathyroidism. But let's just deal with the most common one, which is absorptive hypercalcuria type 1. This is a non-diet-related uh, hypercalcuria where, where uh, uh, patients will hyperabsorb dietary calcium. As you know, only about 40% of dietary calcium is absorbed. The rest is excreted in the gut. And these patients, they uh, tend to uh, increase their enteric absorption probably because they, they uh, have a relatively low uh, uh, PTH. You might pick this up as a subtle uh, finding, so they, 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 they drive uh, uh, the excess uh, uh, serum calcium, which is transiently absorbed uh, uh, into the urine to, uh, to maintain an, uh, an equilibrium. And you can treat these patients very effectively with uh, hydrochlorothiazide or any sort of thiazide diuretic, which acts to uh, uh, re to uh, uh, reabsorb calcium from the distal tubule. Uh, thiazide diuretics tend to decrease citrate, so you always have to combine that with uh, a potassium citrate. Another strategy would be to uh, try and use a binding agent like sodium cellulose phosphate, which is poorly absorbed because it uh, runs a risk of diarrhea or, uh, or, or, uh, or bloating. Uh, very few patients actually have dietary controlled hypercalcuria, which you'd have to do uh, subtle testing. That, that is a Charlie Pack type of two-day analysis in order to, to figure out who has 
uh, a diet-controlled hypercalcemia that if you merely get them to decrease their dietary calcium, that that would uh, solve the problem. Hypocitraturia is usually picked up on by measuring urinary citrate and finding that it's low. It's sometimes associated with calcium phosphate stones or uric acid stones. Um, Hypocitraturia, of course, is uh, often seen in acidotic states, such as renal tubular acidosis. So if you have a systemic uh, acidosis, you might, you might pick that up as well. And this is effectively treated by potassium citrate, which is all, uh, almost without uh, any complications. Uh, one of the things which uh, I often find that my uh, colleagues don't always pick up is, is that you can increase potassium citrate almost indiscriminately in someone who has a severe acidosis if you're trying to compensate for, for their hypocitraturia. So I recall one patient who I had years ago in Texas, a 33-year-old uh, woman who was about uh, this tall, because she had um, a severe RTA uh, uh, picked up at age two and she had topologic fractures and, and sort of had lifelong series of, of uh, osteomalacia and osteoporosis as a result of demineralization from her RTA. And no one had, had tried treating her with, with, uh, with alkalinizing agents. And so, so she had tons of stones, one after the other, uh, when she first came to me. And I had her on effectively uh, 180 milliequivalents a day. I mean, the standard dose is uh, uh, 10 to 20 milliequivalents three times a day, so a total of, of 30 to 60 milliequivalents a day. But you can go up to several hundred milliequivalents a day in order to get to a, uh, a therapeutic uh, uh, level of citrate in the urine. Hyper, uh, hyperoxaluria is uh, increasingly recognized as an important cause of kidney stones. Um, and this is usually related to diet. I'll go through hyperoxaluria in detail in just a minute. The model we have for hyperoxaluria, however, is the malabsorber, something like with Crohn's disease or who's had an iliogastric bypass where they malabsorb fat. Therefore, the fat, which is no longer absorbed, uh, will, will bind calcium. Calcium is no longer absorbed, so then they wind up with excess uh, enteric oxalate now being bioavailable, being uh, hyperabsorbed, and then being excreted in urine. This is actually the minority of hypoxylic yes, Martin. Uh, when do you have to worry about the, go back to the when do you have to worry about the potassium? Yeah, the question is when do you have to worry about giving too much potassium with, with, uh, with uh, potassium citrate? Uh, almost never. I mean, I get the occasional call from an internist worried about someone who's uh, hypertensive uh, 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 or someone who has mild uh, renal insufficiency and are we getting too much potassium load. The amount of potassium in potassium citrate is really negligible. I mean, you're talking about basically what, what happens if you eat a couple bananas a day. I mean, that's, that's the type of potassium load that so really is clinically irrelevant. Primary hypoparathyroidism, other than you're going to pick up a high normal or, frankly, abnormal calcium with a uh, high PTH, there's one answer for that, and that's surgery. So, so I'll just uh, uh, mention that just in passing. And then of hyperuric osteria, which is a risk for calcium stones as well as for uric acid stones, and you can pick this up either as a result of too much uh, uric acid, or certainly in the case of uric acid stones, probably the larger issue is persistently acidic pH. And again, uh, potassium citrate is relevant. And if the uh, uric acid, serum uric acid level is elevated, uh, uh, you may consider trying to uh, reduce uh, uh, purine uh, uh, metabolism with allopurinol. Rarely you get into dietary indiscretion where you'd want to decrease uh, purine. Okay, so once we go over that, let's, let's now deal with some, some interesting issues. First tenet, which I, I talked about, was trying to uh, reduce, trying to um, uh, increase urine volume, which is the, the single most common uh, risk factor for metabolic stones. And this is this is uh, so basic that it defies anyone even paying lip service to it, other than the fact that we have really very poor data showing that it actually works. The concept is very simple: if you have low urine volume, you, you have concentrated uh, solutes, you're likely to supersaturate your urine and run the risk of, of crystallization of stones. So if you increase fluid intake and therefore increase your urine output, it stands to reason that you decrease mineral supersaturation, decrease stone episodes, and yet no one has demonstrated that this actually works 
or that if it works, how well it works. So along came a study about 10 years ago from Italy uh, by uh, Luis Borghi, who's a, uh, published some interesting papers uh, on stones. And here's one where he actually was the first to ever publish data on how well we can affect uh, uh, patients to increase their urine output uh, if they have stones. So here he has 199 first-time stone formers. He has five-year follow-up, and he randomized them into two groups. You increase your water intake or continue doing the same old, same old, the observation cohort. Now, how he got this uh, by his review board, if they even had one in his hospital, I don't know, but it's sort of like saying, well, we're going to randomize these patients to two groups, one of which we're going to tell them to increase their water because they have low urine outputs. The other group, we're going to say, we want to keep you at, at a high risk of stones. We want you to do nothing. And uh, whatever, they, they, they managed to get the study, study done. But what you can see here is that baseline. Well, why is that spreading? You have no data to show that it works in the first place. So uh, why would that be a problem making it through an ethics Bear with me. Bear with me. <laughs> um, so, uh, here's what you have. You start off the baseline where these are incredibly low volume uh, 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 urine outputs. Uh, baseline, they're both at, both at about a liter per day, and they have trends going up to five years. I'm just showing you what happens at exit at five years, where those that were randomized to water jumped from a liter to 2.5 liters a day. Those that uh, were at a liter a day remain at a liter a day at five years. And this was a statistically significant difference and and so you <laughs> and then when he looks at at the uh, the uh, uh, the same groups for the number of new stone episodes, you can see that those that were randomized to water had a, a much lower rate of calcium oxalate, calcium phosphate, and uric acid stones. And so this would be a slam dunk that not only do, if you increase your fluid intake, but you would effectively reduce your risk of stones. Now, you would argue that you'd have to close the study early because they had an increase of stone episodes all throughout the, the, the study. Five years, and you're, you're looking at two categories. One, one, one cohort, which is forming lots of new stones. The other cohort, which is not, you'd have to say, hmm, this seems like a very easy thing to do. We're going to stop this study early and tell the people who are, who are, who are forming stones, drink more water. But they can say, no, 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 for the interest of science, we're going to let you continue to form stones. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but at the beginning, there was yeah. All right, so you would think that this is a slam dunk. Well, this is not a slam dunk. Here's, I think, more credible data from uh, Fred Coe's group in Chicago, uh, published in the Journal of Urology a couple, uh, well, a year ago. And again, the basic model is increased fluid will reduce mineral supersaturation and decrease stone episodes. Uh, so they told their, their patients, uh, almost 3,000, increase fluid, decrease sodium. That was all they told them. This, is, this was a, their, their, their basic uh, 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 instruction patient. We want you to increase fluid, decrease sodium, and then they followed them. They had 13 sites enrolled. Uh, because of a slight difference in what Fred did versus the other sites, he, he looked at his data separately versus the other sites as well as pooling together. And so I'll, I'll mention that uh, for when you're looking at this data. He also con uh, considered that some patients might be on hydrochlorothiazide for hypercalcemia, and he uh, used that as a confounding variable and controlled for that variable. You can see the instructions were very simple. Two liters of fluid a day, less than 100 milliequivalents of salt. So very basic instructions and clear guidelines. So what you find is, looking at this data here, a little bit confusing here, but that it, where you were on the curve initially, if you had a low urine output, you tended to increase your uh, urine volume as the study went on. If you had a high urine output to begin with, you tended not to increase your urine volume that much. But the mean urine increase uh, over time was 350 cc's, not at 1.5 liters as you saw in that prior study. So let's keep that in mind. Next, what he looked at is what happens to urine sodium? Well, in general, as you increase your urine volume, you increase your urine sodium. And here's a pool that you can see very clearly. Increase urine volume, increase urine sodium. Now, because sodium 
induces, or hypernatrituria hyper induces hypercalcuria, this would be counterproductive to the goal of increasing urine volume to decrease your hypercalcuria, but you would run the risk of hypercalcuria nonetheless. So what happens to urine calcium as you increase your urine volume? Well, as you can see, as you increase your urine volume, you increase your calcium excretion. Next, what happens to your calcium concentration? Well, as you increase your urine volume, you tend to drive down overall your, your urine calcium concentration. But in general, to get to a 50% reduction from baseline, you would have to increase 500 cc's a day, given that the mean urine volume increase was only 350 cc's a day. So you would have to be a, a, an extreme outlier of increased urine volume to really make a dent in your uh, urine calcium concentration. And since they looked at not only calcium concentration, but calcium oxalate supersaturation, which is really the, the product that would tell you what your, your stone risk is, and this bottom one, you would have to have, in order to get a 50% reduction in your stone risk, you would have to increase your urine volume by a liter. So effectively, this tells you that for most patients, merely telling them to increase their urine volume it's just one small part of the puzzle and, and that you probably are not going to make a significant dent in their overall stone risk. Or to uh, uh, quote uh, Fred in the discussion, one would think that nothing could be less complex than the advice to increase urinary volume and decrease urine sodium, but in practice, this advice is not simple to implement. And probably it's because most people don't like drinking a lot of water. They like taste. So if you tell them increase fluids, what do they reach for? Juices or, or sodas or, or, or something which has sodium, because sodium is what, what, what gives most drinks some, some taste. And so for a lot of people, if you just say increase fluids and don't tell them what fluids to increase, they'll, they'll take the fluids which may not be helpful. Here's a, uh, here's a case. I had a 61-year-old woman with recurrent calcium stones. And she has a really low urine volume. Oxalate is high normal. Sodium is normal range. Tell her to increase her fluids, decrease her dietary oxalate. She comes back, her volume is now doubled, still low, but she's doubled that. Her oxalate has been reduced, but her sodium doubles. So I think this is a you know, clear demonstration of, of this phenomenon. You can, it's easy to get people to increase fluids somewhat, but it's the fluids that they're drinking which may not be helpful. Here's a paper from Gary Curhan, uh, 10 years from the New England Journal of Medicine. This was part of the Nurses' Health Study, where they looked at 40,000 uh, nurses, 12 of them over time, and looked at a number of parameters, including their diet, uh, as well as trying to correlate diet to uh, episodes of, of new onset of kidney stones. Decreased risk was seen with people who, uh, who uh, drink at least, uh, I think it was one cup of tea per day, one cup of coffee per day, Beer, surprisingly, was a uh, uh, decreased risk. Wine was a uh, uh, decreased risk of stones. Mark, we're in good shape. <laughs> Increased risk for, for apple juice and grapefruit juice. Grapefruit juice, probably uh, uh, because of the acidity, uh, is probably, uh, is, well, at least that's the, the theory of why that was a risk. And water and lemonade were a wash. You didn't see any real statistical evidence that this increased or decreased your uh, your risk of stones. Now, at the time, if you were to ask urologists before this paper came out, you asked them what, uh, what, what fluids will increase uh, stone risk, you would say anything with a diuretic in it will dehydrate you, and therefore any of these beverages ought to increase your stone risk. And these should be neutral, or if anything, should, should help you. And it turns out that, that it's the exact opposite. Now, this, this is not a, a randomized prospective study. Uh, uh, this is a very inexact science, giving people dietary surveys. They tried to validate the surveys, and they did a reasonable job of doing that. But I think just from the sheer number of, of uh, people enrolled in the study, this is very provocative data, which would imply that, that there is something here. Now, um, let's just come back to... Let's just move on here. Now, the same study, another interesting phenomenon was reported. Curhan took on the, the, uh, the basic belief at the time that dietary calcium correlates with, with, uh, with kidney stone risk. So, stated another way, if you increase your dietary calcium and have a really high calcium intake, 
that means you have an increased risk of kidney stones. And that would certainly be true for the very few people who have absorptive hypercalciuria type 2, that diet-related hypercalciuria. But for the overwhelming majority of patients who do not have that phenomena, that's actually the exact opposite of what their data showed. If they, if I'm going to just focus you on the, the, uh, the bottom and top uh, uh, quintiles of dietary calcium intake. So the lowest quintile is uh, an average of uh, 5 to 15 milligrams a day. The top quintile is 13, 26 milligrams per day. The, uh, they normalize the stone risk for the group at the uh, bottom end. So if you're at the 20th percentile, your stone risk is 1. And look, you have 50% risk reduction if you, if you more than double your calcium intake. So that tells you that, that you increase your calcium intake and, and actually you have the exact opposite phenomenon. You have a, a significantly decreased risk of, of stones. So why would that be? Uh, because of oxalate. What we know about oxalate is that oxalate comes predominantly from foods. It also comes not only from oxalate content of foods, but animal uh, protein. So if you increase your animal protein, the liver metabolizes it to tryptophan or hydroxycholine, both of which ultimately get converted into oxalate. So you have a number of ways to get oxalate into your body. Uh, and as I mentioned before, calcium is bound to oxalate in the gut. So if you really increase your dietary calcium, you therefore bind more dietary oxalate. That doesn't get absorbed, uh, and it gets excreted in the stool. So one way of reducing your... your uh, enteric hyperoxaluria is to increase your dietary calcium. To test this hypothesis, uh, uh, Borgi then uh, published a paper uh, two years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, 120 men with uh, idiopathic hypercalciuria. This is another way of saying absorptive hypercalciuria, not that related. Uh, and, and they were randomized to two cohorts. Uh, you could have either a low calcium diet or a normal calcium diet, but you were told to restrict your animal protein and salt, and they were given specific parameters as to what, what amount of protein, what amount of salt. Uh, the, both groups were told to increase their fluids with a five-year follow-up, and this was a randomized prospective trial. And just to uh, uh, show you, this is, uh, in the left columns, you have, what hap uh, you have the baseline, and then you have the five-year data, baseline and five-year data. So the low, cal low calcium or calcium uh, diet uh, restriction and this is a low uh, animal protein and salt restriction. And you can see, let's look at volumes, that unlike our previous data, you now have more of the Fred Co type of data that on average people increase their urine volume about 350 cc's if you tell them to increase their urine volume. Uh, sodium stay the, stay the same uh, in the people told to just reduce their calcium, but those told to reduce animal protein and sodium have a significant reduction of, of uh, urine sodium. Uh, both groups reduce their, their urine calcium. So you see, this is interesting. You can get them to reduce their calcium by telling them to take less calcium in your diet or maintain the same calcium but increase your, your, uh, decrease your uh, uh, animal protein so that by, by having uh, oxalate and calcium bind in, in the gut, you can reduce uh, urine calcium similarly. But look at oxalate. Oxalate uh, increases, this is not statistically significant, but it increases uh, slightly in the low calcium group, but you have a significant reduction of oxalate in the group told to reduce animal protein. The uh, uh, reduction in calcium oxalate supersaturation was equivalent, but the key was the number of new stones was uh, 23 per 60 patients out of uh, five years versus 12 per 60 in this group, and that was statistically significant. So a 50% reduction in stone risk by maintaining normal serum, but normal dietary calcium, but, but uh, reducing animal protein and salt. To quote uh, Clayman in the uh, Journal of Urology when he reviewed his paper in the, the back section of, of Urological Survey, he said one would think that in uh, 2002, I think it was when the paper was done, 2002, uh, state of the art advice to patients with recurrent kidney stones would be no metabolic evaluation and just tell, any, tell everyone to reduce their animal protein and salt and if you have new stones then to do a workup at that point. Um, this is a long list of oxalate containing foods. Uh, you can get this off of any uh, website if you just do a search of oxalate or look in our, our textbooks. But I think the key is you know leafy green vegetables. And there's a number of other things which, which uh, don't really fit the bill of leafy green vegetables 
uh, rhubarb uh, uh, fiber containing cereals, uh, strawberries. Now, you look at this, you say, well, you don't have a lot of oxalate in strawberries compared to oxalate, but ask your patients who like strawberries how many strawberries they eat at a serving. Um, uh, I have a, you know, I, I would think that you would have very few patients that would really like spinach or Brussels sprouts, which are both high in oxalate. I recall one patient, a uh, custodian back in San Antonio uh, at, at the hospital, who uh, I would consider to be part of the, 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 the trailer park community. And, uh, and uh, I remember going through his diet, typical diet. So taking through your average day, what you eat, and he started off by telling me, well, at lunch, he likes to open a can of Brussels sprouts. And then at dinner, he has two servings of spinach. And then when I, I, I said, well, you know, these are high oxalate containing foods, which is why you're getting stones. And, and when he just became like exasperated, like, gosh, you're killing me. If I can't eat Brussels sprouts and spinach, what, I'm, what am I going to eat? <laughs> Um, again, the other thing is uh, meats which are not high in oxalate in of themselves just converted into oxalate, so uh, a, a, a good uh, carnivorous diet will, will leave you at risk of, of stones. So here's a case of a 57 year old woman with left flank pain three weeks. She's had multiple uh, stones before treated by shock or lift tripsy. She's got uh, cost or people ankle tenderness. Her CT scan shows a 9 millimeter uh, left CTJ stone. She treated with Eswell. The stone uh, analysis shows calcium oxalate monohydrate. 24-hour urine shows a relatively low volume at 1.8 liters. The calcium is, is, is nice and low. Uh, uric acid is low. Sodium is high normal. Oxalate is quite elevated at 555. Citrate is low normal. And all of her serum studies are unremarkable other than uric acid being slightly elevated. So here's the dietary history. I just asked patients, take me through your average day. Tell me what you have for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner, for snacks. So a typical breakfast, tea, tea alone. That's a good, good dose of oxalate. Uh, then I asked her, what do you have in your tea, lemon or milk? Lemon. Uh, so she really gets, she doesn't even bind the oxalate uh, by putting milk in it. So she starts off the morning with relatively uh, 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 dehydrated with, uh, with some oxalate lunch, turkey sandwich. Turkey on a molar basis is, is the, the highest form of oxalate that you can give. If you go into the lab, uh, uh, in Charlie Pack's uh, lab, in order to do oxalate studies, they ask every patient to eat a turkey sandwich. So uh, she has a turkey sandwich with iced tea again, dinner, meat, chicken, or fish, so there's her animal protein with a side of spinach or broccoli, snacks, chocolate, nuts, both oxalate containing foods. So this is someone who it, straightforward, you'd want them to change your diet. Not easily accomplished, but at least you know what she has to do in order to reduce her risk of, of uh, hyperoxaluria. Uh, now, since this was a shot across the bow to the sort of the lifetime work of uh, Charlie Pack's group, uh, their group essentially fighting the concept that oxalate rules and calcium is irrelevant, published two papers in the Journal of Urology a year ago uh, which put a little bit of, uh, of uh, spin on, on uh, the uh, Borgi study. And what they demonstrate here, this is a, uh, this is a paper in which they looked at a, a group of normal volunteers that were placed on the high and low calcium diets. Remember I showed you the quintiles that was published in that New England Journal paper by Gary Kerhan. Well, they put everyone on, on both the high and low quintile calcium intake figuring that this would, this would exaggerate their response to dietary calcium. So what happens if you're on a really low calcium diet versus a really high calcium diet? And what they found is uh, that there was, if you're on a really high calcium diet, that you tended to have a slightly higher urine volume versus those that had uh, a low uh, calcium diet. So try to control for this. The pH changes, citrate changes, but the urine oxalate itself did not change. And so they, they theorize that perhaps citrate is more important. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, I would like to believe this data, this is a little bit confusing, uh, the concept that citrate is the root cause of, of calcium oxalate stones based on some subtle uh, uh, calculations they made. You have to look at this data with a little bit of jaundice because uh, Charlie Pack is a very wealthy man based on potassium citrate. Um, uh, but but I won't even, in the of time, I won't crunch through all this other than to show that what they tried to demonstrate is, and they, they showed statistically pH matters and citrate matters. 
uh, taking it one step further, the same group then took a group of recurrent uh, uh, kidney stone formers. These were calcium stone formers with absorptive hypercalceria. This was not diet related, so this would be type 1 absorptive hypercalceria or the idiopathic hypercalceria. And they tried to go with a full core press, basically both dietary calcium and oxide restrictions. Uh, everyone was on hydrochlorothiazide and potassium citrate. They were told to, to increase their urine volume, which they did effectively going from 2.2 to 2.7 liters. Uh, they maintained the line on urine sodium, uh, which didn't change. And they very effectively re reduced the risk of stones from almost three uh, per patient per year down to 0.05 uh, stones per year. This is uh, over three years of follow-up. So clearly, if you could get patients to comply with this very restrictive regimen of telling you to reduce your dietary calcium, dietary oxalate, as well as take medications, you can get a, an effective uh, uh, decrease in stone risk. I, I don't know how you would ever get patients to comply with such a diet. This is very hard. Five diets are also helpful uh, be, not only because they reabsorb calcium and uh, promote hypocalceria, but they increase bone density, which is uh, work that Preminger has demonstrated. This effect seems to stabilize the two years. So if you're using this type of regimen, you have to get patients on thiazide medications for two years, take them off for about three to six months so that their body becomes naive to the thiazide, and then put them back on the thiazide. Uh, this is data where they showed that the bone mineral density actually increases over time if you're on a thiazide diuretic while, while even being on a low calcium diet. Because in the past, many uh, endocrinologists who are interested in stone disease have, have criticized our attempts at reducing dietary calcium uh, in the sense that this would promote osteoporosis over time. So I'm just going to finish up with... Uh, with a couple of, of uh, cases and then uh, go back to my initial table and, and modify it a little bit. So here's a patient who I followed for a better part of 10 years while I was in Texas. He was a big beefy uh, electrician. Um, he had recurrent calcium oxide monohydrate stones. So his serum calcium um, was, uh, this was high normal uric acid, was uh, frankly elevated. PTH was uh, was uh, a normal range. His 24-hour urine showed a slightly low volume. pH was was uh, normal. Calcium was slightly elevated. 300 is considered a high normal is is the threshold range for males. Uh, oxalate was double the normal range in uh, uh, the units we had in Texas. Uric acid was uh, two times normal value. Sodium was also abnormal. And these are these are just massively elevated ranges for oxalate and for uric acid. So here's his diet history. What do you have for breakfast? Coffee or Dr. Pepper? Uh, so there's uh, either, uh, there, there's one form of oxalate. This is just what the stone doctor ordered. And Dr. Pepper is, I think, one of the highest uh, oxalate drinks you can get. So he, but it has no food. So basically, he just has a couple of cups of coffee, Dr. Pepper. Uh, then for lunch, he has barbecue, which in Texas means beef. Smoked meat with iced tea inside. What are sides? Coleslaw. So there's some, there's his leafy green vegetable, so there's more oxalate. Dinner. I like hamburgers. What does that mean? Three or four hamburgers. <laughs> so he gets a lot of purines washed down by cola, some more oxalate. So he's, he's into purines and oxalate. And uh, this, this was really a very compliant patient over time. He did a lot of things to change his diet. Um, and I, I, I got, I mean, it's kind of... Uh, kind of uh, grew to like him because, you know, here's this really big, DC uh, uh, Bubba type of character who, uh, by the time I was through with him, was, was on a, a salad type diet. <laughs> and uh, I, I did get him to, re I mean, I was, I was always unhappy that I never got him to completely um, uh, uh, not have recurrent stones. I think he was averaging about one every uh, six months. But he was one of the last patients I said goodbye to, and I, I, I said to him that when, as we were partying that, you know, I, I feel sorry that I never managed to, to cure you of, of your recurrent kidney stones. And, you know, he just looked me straight in the eye and said, you know, Doc, before I saw you, I was averaging 20 stones a year. Now I'm down to one every six months. I, I view that as, as a great success. And then he, like, grabs my hand and crushes every bone in my hand. <laughs>
<laughs> like putting my hand back. <laughs> so uh, I think the last two things that I want to get across is, is how to how to put this into context of, of where these standard tables are at. So for urine volume, I think it's important that we not only tell people to increase their fluids, but we have to give them specific instructions of what types of fluids are, are good and, and particularly what fluids are harmful. Uh, it's important not to increase their, their, uh, their sodium intake. The ideal drink is either water or lemonade. Uh, there's limited data showing that lemonade uh, delivers a, a healthy dose of citrate. Uh, and, and really all other drinks may be helpful, they may not be, but, but these are the two drinks which, which I, I try and encourage patients to increase their, uh, their intake with. Uh, with. With respect to hypercalcemias, it's not really clear what we ought to do now. Should we put everyone on hot chlorothiazide? Should we tell people to increase their dietary calcium? I certainly tell my middle-aged women and elderly women who have returned to these stones not to decrease their dietary calcium, but it's not clear if, if it's safe to tell everyone, go ahead and just increase your your, uh, your calcium. If they're hyperoxaluric, the, the data is clear. Tell people, take a supplemental calcium, go ahead and have two grams of elemental calcium, take a couple of tons with every meal in, in an effort to bind more oxalate in your gut. Uh, but, but I think that, that the, we're, at a, we're at a bit of a standstill with respect to how do we balance our desire to reduce oxalate and calcium, knowing that there's a reciprocal arrangement that's going on in our gut as well as in the urine. Uh, and then I'll just avoid these cases and just go to, um, oh, this is a, uh, here's I think a, an interesting one. This is a 56-year-old woman with low renal colic for a year. She averages, uh, or she's had over 10 stones in her lifetime, had multiple treatments. Previously, uh, morbidly obese, had an illogastric bypass, which tells you that she's got enteric hyperoxaluria. She's got a stone which we treat with as well. And we, she comes back for evaluation and we see that her oxalate is, again, massively elevated and all the other parameters are effectively normal other than a very low urine volume. So you'd want to tell her to increase her urine volume. The trouble is people who have uh, uh, short gut syndrome don't tolerate a, a, a huge increase in their, their uh, dietary volumes because it, it goes straight through their gut and they complain of diarrhea. So you can only go so far by telling them to increase their fluid intake. And then people who have, say, no gastric bypass are doomed on, on a, trying to tell them to take a low uh, uh, oxalate diet. It doesn't really do any, any uh, difference. These are people that you would really want to, uh, to uh, uh, get to take uh, supplemental calcium. Again, that's two grams of supplemental calcium with each meal. Uh, if you do have to treat them with citrate, because potassium citrate is a slow-release tablet and they have a, a very fast transit time, you might want to get them on a, on a sodium citrate compound just so that they get the citrate in their body. So I think get to uh, Mark's question of when to evaluate. We really don't know when, when is the appropriate time to evaluate, but in general, most people evaluate about three weeks after that you're stone free. The concept being that once the stone is out and the inflammation has subsided, you'll have a, a more accurate representation of what's going on within the kidneys. Uh, uh, if we do metabolic evaluations, 97% of uh, workups will identify at least one risk factor so you have a target to shoot for. However, we know multiple studies demonstrate that compliance over time with any of these regimens decreases, so you have to make some sort of, of evaluation ahead of time. How, how motivated is your patient? If they've had one stone episode in their life uh, and they don't appear to be particularly motivated, you may think twice about putting them through the full metabolic evaluation if at the end of the day they're not going to do anything about it, but it clearly the, one, the patient who has had multiple stones is tired of repeated stones and wants you to help them to avoid stones in the future. And then you can also ask patients, if I take you down this road and I tell you you have to change the diet, is that something you are willing to do? Sometimes they say, yes, I want, I want to change, uh, I, I don't want to have more stones. Sometimes they say, no, it's just not worth it to me and I'll just take my chances. And then how much of an evaluation, whether you should do a full uh, metabolic evaluation, which includes two separate 24 hour urines, one on a normal calcium, one on a restricted calcium diet, or just a standard, uh, uh, you know, take your normal diet and see what is representative of, of what you're eating. I think most people are tending towards this limited evaluation and just a few research centers to a full evaluation. So, with that, uh, thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, dietary off
It's not known. There was, um, I think it was published in the Journal of Urology, I'm not sure, but it was certainly presented at the AUA um, uh, Dean Asimos in uh, North Carolina. Uh, uh, did a couple of elegant studies with normals and then with stone formers where he gave them an oxalate load and just increased the oxalate load and measured urine oxalate in response and it was just a linear response. You increase your oxalate, you increase what goes into urine. And is the same also true of vitamin C? Uh, vitamin C is, uh, vitamin C is, is in that differential diagnosis. It should be at the very bottom. <laughs> and you really have to be, uh, you know, mega dosing vitamin C, like three grams of vitamin C a day for, for this to be an issue at all. I mean, most of it is just not converted into oxalate. Well, thank you very much.